Why, why is Mika important? Mika is the EU's first and fundamental attempt to put regulation around blockchain-based financial activity with crypto assets. It's, as such, it creates a term in law, a clear distinction with existing sectors, and it's going to be decisive and long-lasting both in the EU and internationally. My name is Andrew Whitworth. I'm a visiting fellow at the EUI, uh, where I research on the political economy of digital finance, and I consult in the sector as well. So, what is Mika? Mika is the EU's crypto asset regulation, the Markets and Crypto Asset Regulation is what it stands for. It came into force, partly into force for stablecoins at the first half, uh, at the end of the first half of this year, on June 30th, uh, and it will come fully into force at the end of this year on December the 30th. As such, it marks probably the first uh, global major regulatory framework for crypto assets and crypto asset activity uh, in the world. The objectives of Mika are to create a harmonized cross-EU market in crypto assets and related services. This is interesting in two ways. Firstly, because it's EU, and secondly, because it's about crypto assets, so both geographically and sectorally. What do I mean by this? Well, so in terms of the EU, what it does is it takes the current or the pre-Mika uh, situation where each member state had the ability to create its own rules around crypto assets and define them in their own way and put their own regulations around it, creates an EU level to create a level playing field across the entire single market that will allow scale and growth for crypto asset server service providers and issuers uh, across the whole single market, so nearly 500 million uh, citizens and businesses. So in that sense, it's moving regulation up from the uh, member states to the EU. What that also means is it gives the EU a coherent single voice in international fora when um, negotiating around international standards and regulations for crypto assets. Uh, so in that sense, it creates an EU framework. Now the other part is it's an EU framework for crypto assets. So that's specifically creating a sectoral divide between crypto assets, which it defines in law, um, versus other financial instruments and other types of activity that are already regulated. So in this sense, it creates a, a clear demarcation between traditional financial instruments and crypto assets or digital ledger technology based uh, financial assets. With that, it provides a level of clarity and certainty that other jurisdictions haven't necessarily to this date offered uh, with the assumption and probably fair assumption that this will create business certainty, allow businesses to grow, make it easier for businesses to scale across the continent, while also providing consumer protection, market integrity, and financial stability. It's interesting to quickly think about the context that Mika as a regulation was developed in, uh, sort of 2019, 2020, because that really uh, determines a lot of the objectives and the, and the structure uh, of the regulation itself. So firstly, it developed out of the so-called ICO boom, so the boom of initial coin offerings that started around 2017 and ended in about 2019. Um, what that did, that, what that boom did, is bring a lot of retail investors, perhaps unsophisticated re retail investors, into the crypto market, where at that time, without any regulations and a very global market without clear national controls, um, there was a lot of fraud, a lot of losses that consumers weren't able to, weren't able to uh, handle. Secondly was the invention and the introduction of Libra, uh, which came to be known as DM, so the stablecoin, the original stablecoin proposed by Facebook. Um, what that did is it catalyzed national uh, authorities and central banks to realize that they didn't actually have the luxury of time before regulating stablecoins uh, if they wanted to get ahead of this, because market and, and new players in the market were really moving fast in this space. And then thirdly was the introduction um, by the Chinese central bank uh, of a digital yuan or a program to create a digital yuan. Um, what this did again is show particularly Western central banks that digital finance was coming of age, if you want to put it like that. It was um, happening and they needed to, to organize themselves. So the EU came up, the European Commission came up with its proposals for Mika, which then went through the usual legislative process uh, and ended up with the, with the text that we have now. So this is the objectives and the context of Mika. How does it work? Well, really, Mika does two things. First, it defines and puts rules around the issuance of crypto assets. And secondly, it does the same thing for crypto asset service providers, so the services that allow you to undertake activities with crypto assets. Um, on the first part, you can think of Mika as a residual regulation in that it regulates the residual category of crypto assets. What do I mean by that? Well, there's really a flow chart you can think of uh, to determine whether an asset will fall under Mika, under the scope of Mika, or under something else. Firstly, is it DLT based? So is it based on digital ledger technology? If so, then potentially it's under Mika. Secondly, is it already treated? Is this asset already treated by existing financial regulation? Most importantly, the Markets in Financial Infrastructure Directive, MIFID. 
if it is, then it falls out of Mika and it's regulated under MIFID. Thirdly, does Mika, the scope of Mika, uh, create an explicit uh, carve-out, an exemption for this given type of asset, for example, a non-fungible token, an NFT? If so, obviously it falls out. If this asset passes all those tests, then it falls under the scope of Mika. There's then one final set uh, of uh, sort of decisions to make, which is, does the asset, does this crypto asset purport to maintain a stable value? So is it a stable coin? If so, then it'll be regulated either as an um, asset reference token, an ART, or an e-money token, an EMT, which are the two regulatory categories that Mika creates for stable coins, so-called stable coins. Um, and it, it determines that based on the underlying uh, backing asset or backing assets of the stable coin. If the crypto asset doesn't purport to be stable, so it's an unbacked crypto asset based on DLT, not not a financial instrument under MIFID, not exempt because it's non-fungible, then it will fall under this residual category in Mika of other crypto assets. The irony or the perhaps slight paradox is that the vast majority of crypto assets fall in this other bucket. So that's how it um, distinguishes different crypto assets. It then regulates the issuance of this and largely this is around transparency, disclosure, there are an awful lot of requirements around white papers, what you have to say and how you have to present it. So that's how it, it, uh, Mika regulates the issuance uh, and creates a single, as I say, a single EU market for the issuance of, of crypto assets. The other part is the crypto asset service provision, where Mika provides um, rules and, and, and requirements around an awful lot of different activities that you may undertake or any firm may undertake inside the EU with, with a crypto asset. So this is things like custody, exchange, transfer, uses payments, things like that. Uh, and this creates requirements around it very much governance-based, also very familiar to anyone who's familiar with uh, traditional financial, financial regulation and supervision. So, uh, as I say, things like governance, um, a lot of MIFID-like requirements and prudential requirements, uh, market abuse requirements, things like that, to make sure that there is market integrity, financial stability, and consumer protection. There are a few principles under Mika um, that guide its overall approach. Firstly, it intends to be um, technology neutral in order to be forward-looking so that it doesn't come out of date too soon. Now, we've already seen that that's not necessarily the case because the first test to see whether a crypto asset falls under Mika or not is uh, whether it's DLT-based, whether it's based on digital ledger technology. So it's not fully technology neutral in that sense, but within different types of blockchain or different types of DLT, it does uh, intend to, have ten, uh, to be agnostic uh, technologically. Um, and as I say, it also wants to be future-proof in that sense. It also it imports a, a lot of um, principles from financial regulation that are quite common, proportionality, the risk, um, the, the requirements uh, on a firm should be proportionate to the risk they pose, um, in terms of creating a level playing field between traditional finance and digital or DLT-based finance. Um, it, it follows the international standard for same activity, same risk, same regulatory outcome. Um, so it's, it's trying to ensure that there's, there's fair competition between new technologies and old technologies. It needs to be said that Mika does create, an e, as I said, an EU framework, but it has quite a lot of requirements that force the location of activity inside the EU. Uh, so firms will need to be licensed in the EU. Within the EU, they then have the ability to passport to any member state, which is a great benefit of Mika. Um, but the ability to cross-border transactions outside the EU uh, are quite limited uh, and they're still being kind of hammered out by the so-called level two European supervisor agencies now. Um, for things like stable coins, again, there are some quite strict rules around uh, the use of international stable coins. So you see that Mika is attempting to create a market and grow an industry inside the EU. In so doing, it is perhaps unwittingly, perhaps uh, unintentionally, uh, creating a harder block, a harder line between the EU as a block and and uh, other third parties. Um, so I think just to finish, the only thing really left to talk about is like what does Mika not cover? Um, so it covers crypto assets um, and services provided by them, but it does deliberately leave some things out. The most prominent of those is probably DeFi, decentralized finance. And this is for a very good reason, which is practically speaking, there isn't a good regulatory answer to how to regulate uh, DeFi at this point. The regulatory hook for traditional finance and that Mika follows is you find an institution or an entity that's responsible and you give them requirements. But in pure DeFi, there is no institution responsible. So how do you manage it? So that difficulty combined with the current lack of materiality of uh, DeFi markets, both for consumer protection and financial stability, has meant that the European Commission will come back to that question later this year or early next year um, to think about how to regulate that. I think the other um, important bit that it doesn't really discuss, for a good reason because it's an EU regulation, 
is this interaction with uh, other international jurisdictions, standards and international organisations for financial regulation. Obviously there are a lot of different regulations that will apply to uh, crypto asset service providers and issuers, things like AML, uh, anti-money laundering regulation, um, other consumer protection rules, things like that, obviously taxation um, massively. Um, these are being coordinated by international bodies, but perhaps without much direction, without much, without any hierarchy here. So I think there is scope for the EU with Mika as a sort of first mover to try to embed its principles and its preferred approach into the international system. But there is still a, a lot of coordination problems, both at the international level and then um, sort of with third parties cross cross border, to ensure that. What by definition is a globalized cross-border set of activities, DLT-based finance, can actually work in a way that's safe for everyone and still have the promise that it offers rather than being siloized and fragmented uh, into individual jurisdictions. So there is still some work there to do. Um, but that's Mika, that's how it works and that's what it's all about.